You know the jellyfish spirit you get near the start of Elden Ring? Well, did you know it's the ghost of a young girl? And if you find its sister later in the game, you can release it so they can be together. Dear sister, you find me here? Lovely, but why mention dead jellyfish children? Because in Elden Ring, for every spirit reunited with a sibling, there are several more poor NPC chumps whose otherwise peaceful lives are made immeasurably worse simply for having the misfortune to bump into you, the wannabe Elden Lord, even though you were just trying to help. Oops. In other words, you'll want to do your very best to cling to those warm jellyfish vibes as we bring you the Elden Ring NPCs whose lives you definitely ruined. Sorry to those NPCs, and obviously beware big spoilers ahead for all of Elden Ring. So please, if you would, allow me to call you Lord. You don't say. Thank you. Thank you. My Lord. My Lord. My Lord. Bok the Seamster is an NPC encountered early in Elden Ring who serves the game in two key ways. First, he can alter the player's garments for cosmetic customization, and second, he sets the tone for the entire adventure by being found randomly transformed into a bush for no apparent reason. What'd you go and do that for? Bok appears to be a demi-human, one of the monkey-like creatures that can be found across the lands between, and hails from a cave full of such beasts until he was kicked out, presumably for doing things like wearing a hat and talking when all his peers are more into hitting and screaming. Your quest to help Bok continues if you venture to said cave, where you find the poor thing barely alive, warning you not to go any further. They'll rush in and beat you to a pulp. Unlike Bok, however, you are not a small monkey in a stupid hat, you are a big tarnished with no stupid hat because it's still early in the game and all the really stupid hats don't start unlocking until much later. As such, you can beat the ever-living stuffing out of Bok's bullies and get back his prized possession, a sewing needle. A grateful Bok pledges to follow in his mother's footsteps and becomes your personal tailor, which is really sweet, even after it turns out garment alteration almost always just means removing a cape. Like Bok has a side hustle selling capes on the side. We're on to you, Bok. Nevertheless, you will eventually warm to the humble, self-effacing and unfalteringly loyal Bok, and it soon becomes a pleasure to see him pop up further and further into the game, now able to alter even the swankiest of garments and the stupidest of hats provided with the right tools. I'll be the golden seamster, Bok. Eventually, dear sweet faithful Bok will share with you his heart's deepest desire, to be reborn, and this time not as a weird little monkey monster. Well, they say that Ranala of Rhea Lucaria has the power to help people be reborn. Oh, me? Reborn? Granting this ultimate wish isn't easy, as you'll need to have defeated Ranala, the boss witch who, once bested, can grant rebirth, and found a spare larval tear, the precious items used in the process. But after all the kindness Bok has shown us, helping him to live his dream is the least we can do. And so the larval tear is dutifully handed over. Think nothing of it, my friend. From my rebirth? But these are precious. Are you certain that it's for me? Oh, oh my lord. How did you know? It was my only wish that I might honour you with a decent appearance. At this point, Bok announces he's off to visit Ranala to get the rebirth procedure done. So, like the supportive pal you've clearly proven yourself to be, you'll probably make the trip yourself to see your beloved seamster's new look, which turns out to be a gaunt, staring human sitting entirely motionless. When you talk to Bok in this form, he says nothing. And if you rest and come back, he dies. Shit. Believe it or not, you can avoid this spectacularly horrible fate for lovely Bok by not giving him the means to be reborn like he asks, and instead using an item called Prattling Pate Your Beautiful in his proximity, which voices a compliment aloud, improving Bok's self-esteem and removing the urge to be reborn, I guess. With this solution being incredibly obscure, however, even for Elden Ring, we're guessing the vast majority of players will have helped Bok be reborn like he says, us included, which is why now we spend our time guiltily using Prattling Pate on random other demi-humans, in the hope that we might be able to avoid similar future tragedies. You're yeah, I don't think any of this lot is going to make me clothes. The 
ever met someone with a taste for crab I couldn't trust? You've got a real thing here, eh? And it's only getting better. First impressions can be deceiving, and never is that more true than the first impression you'll get of the NPC called Big Boggart, because the first thing you hear about him is that he's a thief who's nicked a necklace from a woman called Raya, the scumbag. That thug made off with a precious necklace. I need someone to retrieve it. However, when you run the thug to ground, you find he might indeed be a thieving scumbag, but he has other qualities. For instance, an enormous bowl of sizzling barbecued prawns that he's perfectly happy to sell you, and that we're perfectly happy to buy, because Raya's honour is one thing, an enormous bowl of sizzling prawns is quite another. Never met someone with a taste for prawn I can trust. We'd make good mates, I reckon. I'll be seeing you. And so is forged a powerful friendship with the prickly but ultimately warm-hearted Big Boggart, one based on delicious seafood and a willingness to chat idly about the lot of a poor tarnished, but mostly on seafood. Perfect bloody timing, actually. I got crab cooked up fresh. And sure, the crab is delicious, but more importantly, your kinship with Big Boggart is a timely reminder of not judging anyone based on how they look or on a mere first impression, and the importance of helping even those who seem unwilling to be helped. In fact, if we hadn't had our hearts opened by Big Boggart, we might never have decided to help this chap, who's been given the cruel nickname the Loathsome Dung Eater, escape his cell in the fetid sewers beneath Lanedale Royal Capital. I've been here long enough. I will kill again. And defile each corpse with care. Well, the road to rehabilitation is a long one. Anyway, this jailbreaking is hungry work. How about back to Big Boggart for a crab and a chat? There's something I should probably tell you. The word of the Dung Eater. Uh-oh. I was in the same jail as him once, so I know first and he's a god forsaken monster. Uh-oh. Kills people and curses the souls. Does all sorts of sh to the corpses. Uh-oh. Sure enough, by saying yes to every NPC you meet, you have unwillingly unleashed an old horror from Big Boggart's past. And the next time you come to visit your crab cooking chum, he's been horrifically, fatally mutilated with something called the Seedbed Curse. I don't want to live like this. Not anymore. So, please. Oh damn, Big Boggart is dead, and you can probably guess whose fault it is. Dung Eaters. And yours, seeing as you freed the poop gobbling maniac in the first place. Now you must go through the game with guilt and without Big Boggart's wry humour and fine cooking. Missing it all the time, but perhaps never more than when this weird old mage turns out to be a prawn if you kill him. There are countless pests to choose from. Man, Big Boggart would have boiled this up real nice. Bless you. You're a true saint. My name is Topes. Presuming you're interested, I can teach you sorceries, as promised. Only, none of them are particularly great. Elden Ring is an empowering story about starting off as a meagre, low-level tarnished with a minuscule health bar, and going on to get a ghost clone that does the rest of the game for you. <laughs> But not everyone in the lands between can be so lucky as to have a killer ghost clone as a best friend. Some are like Topes, an aspiring mage found peddling spells in a church, who you'll empathise with on several levels. Then, perhaps you could spare some runes. For instance, because he is a low-level sorcerer who'll remind you of your own early struggles, and because he's essentially locked himself out of the house, having left the wizard school where he lives just before they locked it. When they cast the seals, I'd just popped out. And now I'm uprooted from my place of learning. Oh, Topes, we've all been there, mate. How can we help? Well, what Topes needs is a spare key to get back into the Academy and get his life back on track. Unfortunately, the Academy of Rhea Lucaria hasn't left a spare key under the doormat exactly. More like they've left a spare one on the roof past the multi-armed killbox round the corner from the angry wizard, down these other rooftops, past the gargoyles, down a step, down another step, through the window, along the rafters, down the rafters, on top of the chandelier. It's quite the slog, but for a friend, we'll make the effort. We're happy to help someone as friendly as Topes on the road to magical mastery, and besides, presumably, once Topes is installed in his rightful place within the Academy, we can go visit him there. Maybe he'll have more for us to do. The fun is just beginning. Perhaps one day you'll pay me a visit? Who knows? I may be a decorated sorcerer by then. <laughs> perhaps, Topes. Or perhaps next time we go to Rhea Lucaria, we'll find you dead in a chair. 
That's right, your friend Topes took the key you helpfully retrieved and used it, and then presumably was effortlessly killed by some unnamed monster or perhaps a disease or a gas leak I guess FromSoftware decided we never need to know. At least we can honour Topes by looting from his cold corpse the spell Topes Barrier, a spell deflection technique which according to the description is Topes' life work, and one that future generations will eventually realise is an earth-shattering discovery worthy of a new conspectus of the academy, against which even powerful sorcerers have no moves. Okay, I think Topes was beaten to death with a book. Wait, wait, please! I surrender! White flag and all! Well, finally come round, have you? <laughs> well, I knew you would! You're a man of reason! True and true. You may already be familiar with Patches, the scheming bastard who pops up in Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and Dark Souls 3 every time trying to lure you into some kind of trap. Say hello to the nice giant. He adores visitors. And Patches absolutely is back on his bullshit in Elden Ring, and will trick you, shove you, and let you down in several notable ways, most infamously deciding to nope out if you choose to summon him to help with a difficult boss fight. In another series first, however, the scoundrel known as Patches is revealed to have hidden depths in Elden Ring, and to value something beyond shoving unwitting adventurers into holes. Specifically, he's a member of the Volcano Manor, an association of tarnished who live in a house inside a volcano. Their lord is the mysterious unseen Rikard, and their leader is Tanith, who sits on a throne looking regal AF. Why accept the burden of their grace, or be fooled by the dogmatic ramblings of the fingers? Rise with us against the Erd Tree. The manor has a strict philosophy, specifically they don't go along with the admittedly suspicious divine ramblings of the Two Fingers, and surprisingly, the usually pragmatic Patches is a true believer. I always hated the gibberish about Lost Grace and the laughable Two Fingers. I thought I could lend a hand in unmasking the charade. He's also fairly obviously got a bit of a crush on Tanith, which is adorbs. Even after announcing her blasphemous ambitions, she still stands proud. I've never seen a woman quite like her. Having heard the pitch, and seen Patches looking happier and more settled than ever before, you'll quite likely decide to help the Volcano Manor, which starts you on a questline of assassinations that eventually has Tanith send you for an audience with Lord Rikard, who, and stop us if you guessed this already, is a house-sized snake with a human face on its neck, who wants to kill you. Trouble is, beating Rikard effectively ends the Volcano Manor's reason for being, and like a wedding when the free booze runs out, all the NPCs will gradually shuffle off once he's dead, their fellowship disbanded. And that includes poor Patches, who at first appears to put a brave face on the matter. <laughs> well, here I am, untethered, once again. Goodbye, my friend. But it's just a bluff, because later old Patches can be found a short way north in the poison-filled Shaded Castle, and now he's not so chipper. In fact, he appears to be dying, and just before slumping over, hands over a seemingly nonsensical item. Make certain that Tanith gets this. Oh, it's, it's nothing, it's just... makes me sick to see her all bent out of shape. Come on, Tanith, back on your high horse where you belong. You're able then? Then I can rest easy, my friend. Nonsensical that is, unless you read some item descriptions. See, the castanets are described as being used by dancers from foreign lands. Meanwhile, the consort's mask that Tanith wears explains Tanith was working as a dancer in a foreign land when she met her beloved Rikard. So it's a reasonable assumption that Patches, far from being chill about the breaking of the Volcano Manor, which we remind you was your fault, is very much still stuck on Tanith, and hopes the castanets will serve as a reminder of her life before Rikard. A reminder that can't come too soon, seeing as when you next see Tanith, she is, and again, stop us if you guessed this already, feasting on the inside of Rikard's enormous dead face. And if you do hand over the castanets, as poor Patches asked, she... What is it? I have no need of that. I must continue devouring my beloved lord. Doesn't give a shit. 
The castanets do leave your inventory though, and to be fair, we have a strong feeling this questline isn't over, and that a future update to the game will explain WTF is going on with Patches, who vanishes from his last resting spot without dropping any loot, which suggests he may not be dead. But we can be pretty confident that whatever comes next, Patches is unlikely to ever get back the genuine kinship he experienced serving the Volcano Manor at Lady Tanith's side. If we had to put money on it, we'd say Tanith will eventually turn into something horrible as a result of gobbling Rykard's brains, and perhaps having handed over the castanets will somehow alter her fate once that happens, or at least lead to a pretty spectacular dance number. I mean, that's our hope, or else the castanets are pretty much the most useless gift in video game side quest history. Should have given her a little salt and ketchup patches, make this eating challenge a little more palatable. Our lord's carcass is vast, and not easily consumed. Ah. Hello there. Well, it was a battle marvelously fought. You are well and truly a champion, friend. I, on the other hand, am nothing but a crock. One hit was all it took to crack me, and for my insides to come spilling out. After that, I, I hid like a coward, and as such, I can hardly stand to face one such as you. Now, when Elden Ring introduced us to an NPC who wants to be a warrior but is also a large breakable jar, it's absolutely on us that we didn't realise it would end tragically. Or at least that's how it ended thanks to our intervention, because when you first encounter Iron Fist Alexander, he's got his bum stuck in a hole in Limgrave, like a Winnie the Pooh who had a transporter accident with his own jar of honey, and only you can free him. Whimsical would be a good way to describe your subsequent encounters with Alexander, who needs your help several more times on his journey to becoming a great warrior. A journey that involves such sensible steps as baking himself in lava. I know. It's hardly more than lukewarm here. I won't be able to temper my body such that it'll never crack again. And scoffing down the corpses that litter this Caled battlefield, because the funny jars in Elden Ring can't just be funny jars, obviously. They have to also be eating corpses. If I can just squeeze this bunch down inside me, I'll be a mighty warrior again in no time. Alexander evokes the most charming Soulsborn NPCs of old, and so it is with a certain sadness that you find out he's left his home and vowed never to return, though he explains that he does come back to lovingly gaze at that home, in a conversation that would probably have more emotional impact if you hadn't had to oil up his backside to get him out another hole in order to have it. By the gods, you are a man of vision. This will have me as slippery as a toad. Oh, I have a good feeling about this, my friend. Right. Give me a good smack from behind with something nice and big. The home that Alexander was achingly close to returning to here is Jarburg, a peaceful and idyllic settlement sheltered beneath a cliff, where living jars can roll around in the flowers and live the sweet life, as opposed to what you're helping Alexander to do throughout the game, which is get repeatedly bashed about by some of the biggest and scariest enemies in the lands between. <laughs> All for a dream that he's clearly not going to achieve because he is a fragile jar full of people guts, bless him. Your final meeting with Alexander, which happens very close to the end of the game, is the saddest part of all. You'll doubtless be thinking, man, I wish I'd left this big lummox safe in that hole, as he challenges you to, oh no, a duel? Would you kindly undertake my ordeal? Come and tell me when you're ready. I've been longing to fight a warrior as accomplished as you. Clearly encouraged by your example throughout the game, Alexander is desperate to fight you, and I guess, eat you? Let us become one champion together! Which isn't going to happen because Alexander obviously sucks, bless him, and I've been levelling two katanas into god slaying armaments and have 70 points in intelligence, but there's absolutely nothing else to do at this point but fight him. Unless there's a prattling pate item in the game we haven't found yet that shouts the words, for god's sake stop getting into fights you are a fragile jar, go home. <laughs> Victory was impossible. This vessel was found lacking. My thanks. I knew you were the stuff of champions. It was a marvelous battle. I implore you. Take what I bequeath from inside me. All vessels are destined to one day break. But the great Alexander lived as a warrior to his last.
Wow, cool. Love how the nicest NPC just exploded in a shower of gore. On the plus side, if you take a piece of his guts back to Jarberg, you can inspire this sweet child Jar to leave town just like his uncle did, continuing the cycle of pointless Jar deaths. I'll begin my journey once I'm ready to go. As a warrior Jar. In search of glory. Sorry, did we say on the plus side earlier? We meant everything is terrible, and we're sorry, Alexander. Anyone who's been on a long hike through somewhere as scenic as Lyonia of the Lakes will tell you it's vital to bring snacks. Some trail mix, granola bars, or like one Elden Ring NPC, perhaps you have a fruitier preference. If I might be so bold as to ask, would you donate any Shabriri grapes in your possession to me? Hayata is an aspiring finger maiden, undertaking a journey towards distant light, which to be honest sounds a lot like the journey you, the Tarnished, are on, seeking lost grace with your own maiden pal, Melina. Hayata is visually impaired, however, and says the grapes briefly show her the way to go. And seeing as you probably will have a Shabriri grape on hand by the time you meet Hayata, hey, grubs up. Many thanks to you. Now I can feel the distant light once more. You are most kind indeed. Hayata, you want to row a fruit too? I've got about, uh, oh, uh, 10 million? Helping Hayata by feeding her grapes when you find them will gradually move her northwards, presumably towards that wonderful distant light she's questing for. It's a quest that you can enjoy for as long as it takes you to actually look at the item description for these grapes you're feeding Hayata and discover that, oh, WFFS, they're human eyes. That's gross, but at least you can still do the right thing and come clean to Hayata about the fruits she's been gobbling. No. At which point she'll do something expected, which is to say, start puking. So those noises I heard were... <laughs> and then something unexpected, which is to say, being into it. Oh crap, what have we done? I've gleaned something very important indeed, thanks to you. The reason why it was eyes I had to eat. Soon enough, regular oozing eyeballs of the infirm aren't enough to sate Hayata. She wants a fingerprint grape, which is a very euphemistic term for an eyeball from someone who's actually been grasped by the three fingers of the frenzied flame. Sounds chill. <laughs> Because we can't have nice things, that distant light Hayata was talking about is indeed nothing to do with the gentle golden glow of the round table hold and the two fingers, but the searing yellow burning of the three fingers, guardians of the frenzied flame of madness. Okay, okay, this seems bad, but you can at least still help Hayata begin her new life as a finger maiden, right? Even if it's for the freaky kinds of fingers. And besides, if you do inherit the frenzied flame yourself, your own maiden, Melina, won't want anything to do with you. A pity. You are no longer fit. Our journey together ends here. So, here's a job opening for Hayata. All we need to do is touch her briefly on the forehead. Oh, it burns. And then she's free to live her life as a finger maiden, offering sage wisdom on the origin and meaning of the frenzied flame and oh, oh no, wait, wait, Hayata, what, oh, oh no, yep, yep, she's catching fire. Yeah, she's on fire. Yeah, she's died. This is what happens in Elden Ring if you try to give someone a grape. Tarnished, are we? I wonder you should turn up here. I am Selen, a sorcerer, quite plainly. Why are you here? Magic in Elden Ring is a mysterious and fascinating force with plenty of intriguing lore behind its usage and origins, but more importantly, it will let you absolutely melt bosses like your Goku with a pointy hat. As such, you'll want to learn and explore as many sorceries as possible, and there's none better to help you on your journey than Sorcerer Selen. A yen for glimstone sorceries? Well, your aptitude does appear... passable. Selen is a friendly dealer in magics who you'll soon warm to, despite the fact that like so many Elden Ring magicians, she wears a weird stone face, although it seems likely this portrait found in Rhea Lucaria shows what she really looks like. In fact, it's odd that the wizard school keeps this picture on the wall, because when you've made significant progress in the game, Selen will reveal she was booted out the academy. It was for attempting to restore the primeval current of Blinstone sorcery. The toothless pedantry peddled by the Karian royal family can rot for all I care. 
I want glimstone sorceries that open our minds, unbound by terrestrial taboos. Well, we've got no idea what a primeval current or a Carian royal family is, but if it means helping Selen, we're all in. Especially if the process involves getting one over on the Academy of Rare Lucaria, which is where Bok and Topes died, and seems like a very badly run school indeed. Probably because the headmistress is Renala, and the deputy headmaster is an enormous wolf with a magic sword. <laughs> You're lucky I'm not the Ofsted Inspector, mate. Helping Selen is a very involved quest. First, you need to break an illusory wall and find an imprisoned sorcerer deep within a cavern in Kaelid, at which point Selen will reveal she too is a prisoner. Her true body is cruelly shackled to a wall in the Witchbane Ruins, and she believes someone wants her dead. So, in a bold display of trust, she asks you to keep hold of her very soul, that it may one day be transferred into a new body. <laughs> And just in time, because it turns out the one keen to execute Selen is none other than Jeren, the bloke in charge of Kaelid's War Festival, whose name was presumably chosen five minutes before Elden Ring shipped. Ah, well met. I hardly expected to see the champion of the festival here, of all places. You didn't know Selen, did you? No, buddy, no, I just happened to be passing this incredibly obscure and specific underground jail cell. Never seen it before in my life, honest. But we're not done. Having helped Selen dodge death by Jeren, you need to find somewhere new for her soul to live. A new body for Selen is staggeringly well hidden, behind not one, but two illusory walls in the distant Three Sisters region. But it's worth it to revive your favourite sorcerer, who is at last free to fulfil her dream of bringing the primeval current to Rhea Lucaria but only if you choose to assist her in killing Jeren in a climactic final showdown. <laughs> Bet Jeren's wishing he'd put a few points in intelligence now. And then at last, the job is done. Selen takes Renala's place and gratefully rewards all the help you offered. She tells you to go and become Elden Lord and that you will always be her darling pupil. She gives you some great loot and even a little good-natured ribbing. If you failed to claim your throne, you can always pay me a visit. Oh, don't fret. Even my dullest pupils will always have a place here. <laughs> and in absolutely any other game, that would be the end of Selen's questline. But because this is Elden Ring, if you reload the area, Renala has come back and Selen is transformed into a horrifying ball of heads! <sighs> My... Oh. I... I... The ball of heads that once was Selen can only splutter painfully, so we've no way of knowing how our good friend and teacher was transformed into such an abomination. Perhaps her experiments with the primeval current went horribly awry, or perhaps Renala punished her for trying to take control of the academy, or perhaps f you, it's Elden Ring. <sighs> The only thing we know for sure is that this game can absolutely do one. I'm too furious to do an outro for this video, so please watch something else we made, or join the OX Supporters Club on Patreon. There's a Discord, it's cool. Thanks for watching, don't get turned into a ball of heads.